I'm Sam Roberts of The New York Times, and welcome to the start of our 27th year of The New York Times Close Up. And thanks to you, our viewers, and my present and former colleagues at CUNY TV and New York One News, especially our producer, Doris Bergman, for your years of support. Today, we'll be joined by the writer and musician, Jamie Bernstein. Her memoir, Famous Father Girl, celebrates and reveals Leonard Bernstein, she knew best as dad. He was the subject of last week's Arts and Leisure section, celebrating what would have been his 100th birthday, and her book reviewed in the Times Book Review. My Times colleagues discuss the lead issues of the week on the backstory, and I'll have some additional thoughts on CODA. But first, Jamie Bernstein, the author of Famous Father Girl, a memoir of growing up Bernstein. It's just been published by HarperCollins, and in the August 12th edition of the Sunday Times Book Review, Times Deputy Editor of the Styles section, Alexandra Jacobs wrote, Jamie is in print, a warm but unsparing eyewitness. She grew up swaddled in cultural luxury. How to forge an identity when the home fires burn so hot? Her father didn't just cross boundaries, he barged through them. The hardest feat in the world to pull off was to have a little one-on-one -on -one time with Daddy, she recalls. Why did you write this book? It just seemed like the right moment. I'd been thinking about writing a memoir for years, and then I was having a conversation with the gentleman who became my book agent and told him about my idea for a memoir, and he said this incredibly pragmatic thing. He said, well, you realize, you know, if you write a memoir and you key it into your dad and it comes out during your dad's centennial year, you're going to sell a book. And it, it couldn't It's have, not a bad idea. It, it was just a completely pragmatic piece of advice, but it was like he'd shot me out of a cannon. I suddenly realized, it's true. This is it. I'm doing it right now. And I literally ran home from his office and started writing. Seize the day. I did. When did you realize you weren't growing up in a normal household? Well, part of it uh, is in the title of my book, which was uh, something that my second grade classmate, Lisa, used to call me to tease me, famous father girl. And so already in second grade, uh, I was getting the inkling that there was something unusual about my father and my family. And he was on television with the Young People's Concerts starting when I was five years old. And so... I remember going to one at Carnegie Hall. Well, there you go. They began at Carnegie Hall. And then when the Philharmonic moved over to Lincoln Center, so did the Young People's Concerts. But they remained on television throughout. They were live in the beginning, which was kind of nerve-wracking for my dad. But eventually they invented videotape and, then, and the teleprompter. That mm -hmm. was a great invention for my dad. Um, but in any case, I, w I saw these programs on television, and to me and my siblings, nothing was more illustrious and important than television in our lives. So for our dad to be on TV, that was like a big deal. But it took a little longer for us to really figure it out. Uh, our, our little private joke between my brother and sister and me for, for this question, when people ask us, when did you figure it out? Our, semi-joke answer is it was when we were watching the Flintstones and Betty and Wilma were going to the Holly Rock Bowl to hear Leonard Bernstone conduct and we were gobsmacked you know wow daddy's on the Flintstones he must have really hit the big time he must be important it did, is a real episode actually did he ever imbue you and and your brother and sister with a sense of music with a desire to become a musician you obviously tried that i did for some years try to be a singer songwriter and i moved out to la and got into the whole pop music scene now, and we, all we that. interviewed uh, paul robeson junior on this program once and i asked him whether his father ever gave him any advice. And Paul Robeson Jr. thought for a minute and he said, yes, my father told me never try to sing Old Man River. <laughs> now, what kind of advice did your father give you? good advice for all of us. <clears throat> right. Um, well, I don't know. I would say that my father wanted us to be curious and lively 
and happy and adjusted in the world. And, and while we were not being exhorted to become creative artists necessarily, I think that the subtext of our entire experience was that the most interesting and cool and lively and intelligent and creative people were the artists. And so our friends were all in that world. So it wasn't exactly that we were told to be like them, but it was the default position. So why would you ever want to be a lawyer or a businessman when you could be in the world of the arts? He was in the arts. He was a musician, as he called himself, a conductor. He was a celebrity. Was he happy? Oh, was he happy? I mean, is any complex creative person happy? Is any human being altogether happy? I don't know. He was a very complicated person, and he had in incredible and enviable heights of ecstasy in the course of his work as a conductor and as a composer. Um, and he also had terrible depths of despair and depression because that's part and parcel of being a creative person. What is Elf's Thread? Oh, Elf's Thread is my father's fantastic anagram, because he was a big wordsmith, uh, anagram for self-hatred. And he coined it on the tennis court, playing tennis with my brother when my brother was still pretty young and wasn't, a, wasn't yet the great tennis player he became. And the two of them were very competitive. And so when my, f when my brother would lose, he would get very upset and go stomping up the hill in tears. And he hated losing. So did my dad. He hated losing, too. So anyway, my father uh, devised this expression, elf's thread, to throw at my brother when he would be in tears over losing. Uh-uh, elf's thread, my father would say. You said in the book that your father had family. He had a career in which he was a great success. He always wanted something more. What else did he want? I think my father wanted to write the great American opera. Well, I don't think it. He said it. So in retrospect, we might even say that West Side Story is the great American opera. But my father felt that he could do better. And, and he had uh, tremendously ambitious ideas for this other work that he still felt he was going to write, but he died before he could write it. You treat sort of matter-of-factly his sexuality, both the fact that uh, you said it was hard for you not to feel your father's sexuality as a daughter and also his bisexuality as a father at a time when that was not particularly accepted. How do you explain the fact that you're kind of so blasé about that? Well, blasé might not be quite the right word. Okay. I'm, I'm not blasé, and it was not easy to cope with all of this complexity at a time when people didn't really have the words for it yet. Nowadays, you know, if your parent turns out to be bisexual, there, there is a world and, a, and a, a, a way of discourse to discuss such things. But back in the late 60s, early 70s, we didn't really have the vocabulary yet to, to go there. So it was complicated for me, for sure. But my general rule of thumb in life, as well as in the writing of this book, is that it's always better to tell the truth and, and, and describe something or communicate about something the way you experienced it, rather than try to obfuscate or to hide something that you're uncomfortable about, because inevitably, whatever it is you tried to hide is going to come around and bite you in the butt. How did your mother cope with it? Well, my mother went into her marriage with my father with completely eyes open. They both did. We found letters that our parents had written to each other that testified to this, that they, they knew exactly how complicated it was. My mother knew that my father was bisexual, and they just loved each other and decided to throw themselves in anyway. How did not so much knowing your father, knowing your parents growing up, but how did writing this book make you think about how you raised your own kids? Oh, well, again, life is complicated and people are complicated and marriages are really complicated. And so as my husband... Getting up in the morning is complicated. Yeah, and it's true. 
um, especially for people like my dad, who had a lot of trouble getting up in the morning. And I think it's, it might be something that you can inherit because it, it runs in the family for sure. But um, again, you know, when we were raising our kids, my husband David and I just tried to keep it all direct and warm however and whenever we could. And things got complicated anyway, they just do. They're not easy. If your dad was sitting at the table with us, what would you want to ask him that is not answered in the book? No, oh, that's a great question. Um, I have a lot of questions for him now that I have become uh, much more aware of the, the extent to which the FBI kept tabs on my father mm -hmm. and uh, through the freedom of- his political views? Yeah. So. Well, you know, he was a dyed-in-the-wool lefty from his earliest adulthood in his, in his 20s, in the 1940s. The FBI was already keeping a file on him because he would help any left-wing group that asked him for help. He would give money, he would lend his name, do benefit concerts, anything. He, he, was, he wasn't very careful in asking questions about these organizations. So then later on, when there was the Red Scare, anybody who signed up to help a lefty organization was immediately in the crosshairs of the FBI. And by the time he saw his file in the 1980s through the Freedom of Information Act, it was 800 pages long. Mm. Let me throw you a real softball. If Tom Wolfe were here, what would you ask him? Well, I would ask him if he was even remotely aware of the extent to which he damaged my family by writing his airy, snide little radical chic piece, which got him so much notoriety and fame. And I don't know whether he had a clue uh, about the extent to which it really damaged and, and hurt our family. Was it accurate? Uh, it wasn't accurate in the sense that he was writing about this event as a party that my father threw. It was not a party and my father didn't put on this event, it was a fundraising event that my mother put on. And my father just happened to wander into it halfway through when he got home from his rehearsal. But of course, the minute he walked into any room, he sort of took over and all eyes were upon him. So that was the beginning of the misunderstanding. Jamie Bernstein, thanks for joining us. The book, Famous Father Girl, a memoir of growing up Bernstein, just been published by HarperCollins. Coming up next, the backstory. Welcome back, and what kind of week has it been? Most of the political world honored the legacy of Senator John McCain, who died this week after a valiant battle with brain cancer. More leave takings from the White House, and locally, candidates pressed their cases on the airwaves with debates among Democratic candidates for attorney general, lieutenant governor, and governor, and housing authority employees and their bosses under fire yet again. Joining me to discuss these stories and more, my New York Times colleagues, contributing writers Clyde Haberman and Eleanor Randolph, and Metro political correspondent Shane Goldmacher. Shane, you watched those debates this week, and before those debates appeared, you wrote in the Times and at nytimes.com what to expect. Now you've seen them. Were you surprised? Um, you know, I was surprised by a few things in the governor's debate in particular. Uh, Andrew Cuomo, I expected to not at all be the aggressor. Uh, the concern for most people was that his sort of potential anger or temper would flare up. Uh, but he was actually pretty aggressive on stage, uh, more than I certainly expected. Um, look. I don't think that this de debate was a decisive debate in this race. I think it was an enormous audience for Cynthia Nixon. There was a lot of interest in this debate. And it was our chance for her, she can't afford television ads right now, to present herself for an hour before voters. And I think people would come across thinking, this is a credible candidate for governor. Uh, that said, I don't think that he did anything to dramatically change the, the dynamics of the race in which he seems ahead by a lot, uh, not just in polling, but in finances and in most other measurements. It was interesting that the debate itself was smothered on both sides with Cuomo TV advertisements, too. Right. <laughs> yes, including, a, including one showing Cynthia Nixon supporting him over the years. Yeah, I mean, it was, um, 
what, what I came away with was the possibility that this uh, race is not, I mean, that Cuomo is not going to win this race by 30 points, that it's going to be closer than that, probably, what, 40, 45 maybe, or, you know, over 30 for Cynthia Nixon. And we were talking about it, uh, Zephyr Teachout got 34%. 34%. And which was considered, um, a, you know, a knockout at that point. Uh, and um, I mean, she's she came across as well studied, and she she knew, had done her homework. She knew what she was talking about, and uh, you know, and I thought being aggressive was important for Cuomo because he didn't. The, the other side is to be patronizing, so he had to find that. Uh, that balance, and I think he did. Uh, you know, one of Andrew Cuomo's notable characteristics is that he's widely unlikable, widely unliked, uh, and, and he can be. I'm not sure if Mrs. Uh, Miss Nixon didn't fall into that a little bit herself with the constant interruptions uh, of him. Usually it's guys interrupting women uh, in, in these situations, and they deservedly get slapped for it. And. Uh, I'm not sure she did herself any good by repeatedly uh, breaking into what he was saying. Well, uh, Shane, was that a tactic to try to rattle him? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it, I think it I think did so. in the first half right. of the debate. You know, my colleague but, Jesse McKinley and I wrote about his posture. It went from seated like this, perched forward, to leaning back. Once she stopped those interruptions, he got much more comfortable on the yeah. debate stage. What difference does it make if she gets 25 percent, 35 percent, 40 percent? If Andrew Cuomo wins, he wins. You know, I think it does make a difference because she has articulated a number of issues that are really important. She really hammered the MTA, and as you saw in that debate, Cuomo is still trying to say, you know, that he's not totally responsible for the MTA, which he is. You know, the, it, the state runs the MTA. So she has really made a big deal of that, and, and um, so that's one thing. She's talked about marijuana. She's talked about a Roe v. Wade for the state, things that he is talking about as well now. But in a funny way, if he gets reelected, which he would be favored to do, presumably over a Republican, if he wins the nomination, I mean, arguably, he could do whatever he wants. Well, yes, but, you know, Eleanor is quite right that if she wins a substantial yes. share of the vote, uh, <laughs> 40, 45 percent, there might be an awful lot of Democrats to stay home. Uh, and and they're, they're notorious for that. I, if any, the, nothing beats Democrats better than Democrats, uh, and especially Democratic voters uh, who always seem to fulfill the classic line about they put together a firing squad by forming a circle. Uh, and, uh, and so if a lot of them stay home, as they did in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and Michigan. And Queens. And two years ago uh, in the nationally, it, it, can, it can affect a lot. I would just say that New York Magazine did a big profile of her a couple months back earlier in the race. And the, the headline online was Cynthia Nixon has already won. Um, on the number of issues in which he moved, That's which was right. substantial. It seemed like an ominous headline, too, though, in its own way, which is that he was co-opting the issues in which she wanted to run, and that's very true, right? Mm -hmm. She wants to get to the left on marijuana, he gets to the left on marijuana. This was one of her complaints about him, right? He had to be drag kicking and screaming to increase the minimum wage, but guess what? The minimum wage was increased. That's what, what campaigns are all right. about. That's, that's right. what politics is all that's about. Right. And well, she, you know, deserves credit, I guess, for getting yeah. those things done. One, one imponderable, for me, imponderable for me, if I may, uh, is sort of a Trump factor in a way of to what degree will a lot of people decide that the governorship uh, is not an entry-level job. Uh, we have a guy, president, who treated it as an entry-level job, and clearly the politics of Trump and, and Nixon are very different. But the basic point is they're both TV people. They're creations of television. And to what degree will there be a number of people saying no more? And what about the flip side of that, that people don't want another insider, don't want someone so tied to Albany and it's time for somebody fresh? Well, that, you know, that's one of the reasons that some of the political pros are saying that she's going to do better than 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 a 30 percent, you know, uh, difference between her and, and Cuomo. But, uh, you know, I mean, I think 
there is a there are people and they are in the Democratic Party and there are a lot of them who really want somebody to be punching Trump in the nose constantly. And if you look, at, I mean, <laughs> that's one of the things that Cuomo's really good at. He's a he's a fighter. He's a, you know, he 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 likes, uh, you know, taking it to ground. And um, I think that even you look at what he did about the taxes, you know, the trying to fight back on climate change. He's been going after Trump in a way that is satisfying to a lot of Democrats. Shane, uh, they managed to uh, run the lieutenant governor debate at a time when no one is going to see it. The, uh, uh, what does that race look like uh, for what it's worth and uh, also the attorney general race? Uh, I find the lieutenant governor's race a fascinating test of political dynamics in the state, but you're right. No one is going to see a single 30-minute debate airing on a channel that reaches one county in New York this State. This is why you're a political reporter, because you find it fascinating. That's I, right. I, and I, you're going to watch it. Well, the, the, the test of the lieutenant governor's race is you have an African-American candidate from central Brooklyn uh, running against the governor's political operation with a woman from uh, from the Buffalo area, right? So she has the money. He has nothing. This guy has not enough money. To, to basically fly around the state even. He's driving to Syracuse to go to the state fair, and yet he's seen as a potential threat, and the idea of him in lieutenant governorship does not make Andrew Cuomo happy. The last thing he wants is an activist, outspoken person who's going to oppose him at every turn. And what about uh, Attorney General? Uh, the dynamics seem to have shifted in that race. Tish James, the Democratic Party sort of official designee, along with Cuomo, had been seen as the front runner. Uh, the Times editorial board endorsed Zephyr Teachout. She's received some other endorsements as well. They had a debate this week, and the revealing moment, every candidate gets to ask somebody else a question. Everybody asked her their question. Uh, she clearly is the one with the target on her back. She has a new television ad out sort of featuring the fact that she's seven months pregnant, uh, going after Trump in very aggressive terms and, and sort of old-school founding father's images. It actually reminded me some of the, the early Rand Paul Ron Paul imagery of sort of revolutionary talk um, that uh, it's not clear when that's starting to go on television, but it, she put it up online today, and I think they're hoping to buy some TV time. Uh, also, what does the state Senate look like? Will it go Democratic uh, in November? And does that call Andrew Cuomo's bluff? He's been blaming the Senate for years about the things he wasn't able to do. If they go Democratic, he's got no one to blame anymore. Well, it's certainly possible. You know, I mean, what I have found interesting was that um, the um, the Independent Democratic Conference, which sort of disbanded just in time for the election, and and scurried back to the Democratic Party, they they almost all scurry is a good verb. <laughs> they almost all have challengers this time around, and who knows whether those challengers can win? Because you know, isn't. I mean, if you if you win an office in Albany, you are really it's like the Supreme Court. You're there for life almost. So um, they, but the uh, there are other races. There are races in Long Island and there are races out in Western New York that uh, uh, Democrats could take in the state Senate, and they would have a majority. Thanks to all of you for joining us, Clyde Haberman, Eleanor Randolph, and Shane Goldmacher. And I'll have some additional thoughts coming up next. In 1969, when Mayor John Lindsay was seeking a second term and facing tough challenges, he transformed his reelection campaign into a referendum on the war in Vietnam. He won. I was reminded of that race by this week's gubernatorial debate. Like Lindsay, Governor Cuomo admitted a mistake or two, but the thrust of his message was that he, as the embodiment of the state of New York, is your best defense against President Trump. September 13th is a Democratic primary, of course, so there'd be no point in appealing to Trump supporters anyway. But while Cuomo promised to do everything short of running for president himself to thwart Trump's agenda, What's his affirmative platform for the next four years that he couldn't or wouldn't accomplish in the last eight? Parsing his rhetoric can be complex, but here's what stood out to me. If he's reelected, some form of fee will be imposed on vehicles being driven into Midtown and downtown Manhattan. 
a limited version of sports betting will be allowed in New York. Using and possessing small amounts of marijuana will be legalized. Cuomo admitted to experimenting with it in college. Nobody even blinked. And if the Democrats win a voting majority of the state Senate, laws might also be passed to reform campaign financing and to bar state officials from collecting outside income, or at least requiring them to fully disclose its sources. Cynthia Nixon more than held her own in the debate. She stumbled a little, but she had done her homework. She found her targets. She ruffled the governor, but didn't rattle him. He called her a corporation because she had formed one for tax purposes as an actress, which is customary. She insisted that she's a person, not a corporation, and told him to stop lying. He kept claiming New York City owns the subways. In fact, decades ago, Albany made mass transit in the metropolitan area a state responsibility. At the same time, he explained that he had deployed state troopers in New York City to make sure scoff laws don't evade tolls on the bridges and tunnels, which are controlled by the same state authority that runs the subways. They implicitly agreed about one point. Neither was begging for Mayor de Blasio's endorsement. Was that one and only gubernatorial debate a game changer? Probably not, if you were already decided. If not, though, Nixon performed as a credible alternative, or at least as a protest candidate. She can also win by losing. In the 2014 primary, Cuomo's challenger, Zephyr Teachout, was defeated, but got 34% of the vote. For Nixon, anything better than that would be a victory of sorts. For The New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.